Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. At the outset, I'll ask everyone to switch off electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so that they do not affect the committee's work. Now, at agenda item one, we are invited to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed? Thank you, we are agreed. Item two will be uh, looking at Murray College. Uh, our first substantial item will be to take evidence on the 2015-16 audit of Murray College. We've already taken evidence from the Auditor General and Audit Scotland, and I now welcome today's witnesses. From Murray College, we have Anne Lindsay, the Assistant Principal, Peter Graham, the Board Chair, Murray Easton, Board Vice Chair and Chair of the Finance and General Purposes Committee, and Nick Clinton, the Director of Finance. From the University of Highlands and Islands, or UHI, Clive Mulholland, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor, and Fiona Larg, Secretary and Chief Operating Officer. Uh, before moving to questions, I'll briefly set out some background to this evidence session. The Auditor General told us, we are seeing a failure of financial management, which at the highest level manifested in the need to ask for what was effectively emergency funding from UHI in 2014-15 and in 2015-16 so that the college could pay its bills and meet its financial obligations. That should not happen in a public body. The funding in question amounted to almost 700,000 in 2015-16. It's also worth noting that Murray, Council, uh, Murray College's staff costs accounted for 72% of its gross expenditure in 2015-16, which is higher than the Scottish average of 63%. Uh, and those staff costs are estimated to increase to 78% for 2016-17. I now invite Peter Graham, Chair of the Board, to make a brief opening statement. Mr Graham. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Chairman of the Board of Murray College, and you've taken the first three lines of my introduction where I was going to introduce people, so my, my apologies, I'll just sort of catch up to where I was. I think what we want to do is try and get to the root cause of the financial situation. And while the financial year in question is that of 2015-16, almost all of the underlying issues existed at the end of 2014-15. Similar to most significant incidents, there's no one single cause. The situation arose as a result of a number of risks being exposed by a series of circumstances, events and behaviours which came together during 2014-15 which combined to create a sequence of deficiencies across the college system of internal control resulting in the breakdown of financial management. The single biggest contributing factor was the poor performance of the then financial director. I must point out that Nick Clinton has only been in place for three weeks as our new financial director, so it's important that there's no cross-reference or mix-up on financial directors, as it were during 2014-15, something which cannot be legislated for, and he was, that was then followed by a leave of absence during 2015-16. Underlying risk factors affecting the wider control environment at the time included the regulatory framework, changes in the education sector since 2014, including the ONS reclassification process and associated changes in financial reporting, budgetary pressures, reductions in funding, as well as inflationary pressure, pressures on payrolls and other costs, budgetary control, weakness in process, compliance and systems, internal reporting, inconsistencies in data and irregular timing of reports, SMT factors, changes at principal level and assistant principal on compassionate leave, board factors, Prince, the, the, the chair of the F and GP had personal issues, which meant that he was unavailable for a large part of that period. UHI factors, role of RSB still being defined and implemented in the interrelationship between the two institutions. SFC factors, agreement to request for early drawdown in funds from April 14. It's a fair catalogue of errors and mistakes, but the management of the board of Murray College believe the issues within their control have and are being subsequently addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Just, uh, if I may begin, uh, so the first question uh, I'll direct just to Anne Lindsay, if I may. I, I believe there was some confusion about uh, your attendance today. Would you be able to clear that up for us, please? Um, so um, I, I am not aware of any confusion over my attendance, to be honest. I think the college decided that the best approach was for the financial expertise people to, to come today, which would have been our Director of Finance and our Convener of the Finance and General Purposes Committee. Um, as another senior executive member, I was happy to attend. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to look at the voluntary severance scheme. Uh, just before I do, uh, Mr Graham, a, a very brief question. Did I hear you right that the that you put a lot of the difficulties down to the poor performance of a previous finance director in your opening statement. Did, was that correct? Yes. Can I ask Murray to answer on that for me? Yeah, I, th I think what we found is that the, I was not there at the time. Um, I've only been in the position on the, the board for the last year. But what seems to have happened is the finance director at the time had been, been there for a considerable period of time and had built up a strong level of trust with the board and with the management team based on his track record. There had been nothing to suggest anything untoward in his performance. There had been no financial irregularities up to that point um, and no evidence of anything other than good, competent management of the college's financial affairs. It was only in that last year, and it seems there's a number of contributing factors, including all the pressures of changes brought in by the ONS reclassification, um, budgetary pressures on him, the, the things that Peter alluded to, that somehow his behaviour changed. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the underlying procedures and controls within the college were, were broken. There were some weaknesses that we, we did pick up and address, but we couldn't legislate for the, the apparent change in behaviour where a new principal at the time and, a, and the FD under pressure resorted to a style of behaviour which is, seemed to be more about holding the line of the budget and not releasing bad news, being focused more on uh, financial reporting obligations to the SFC rather than using good quality financial data to actually run the affairs of the college. And the previous financial director is no longer there? Correct. He went on sick leave during 1516 and left the college in the middle of last year. Do you recall the terms under which he left? Was that a straight resignation can or I, was there a... Can I answer that? Yes. It was a compromise agreement. It's confidential between the college and him, but it was a managed departure. Right. Uh, well, let's look at uh, compromise agreements and voluntary severance. Uh, there, there is a proposed scheme. Uh, are you in a position to give us an update on where the voluntary severance scheme is, please? I am. We are still, with the assistance of the UHI, answering questions to the Scottish Funding Council with a view to putting together uh, a scheme. It closed uh, two weeks ago. I don't think it would be fair to the parties who have applied to go into individuals, but there were a dozen applicants, 10 of whom we've made a business case to accept, and we are still discussing with the Scottish Funding Council um, as late as last night, uh, we were talking to Mr. Kemp. And uh, so 12, I think you said, have applied. Uh, are any of the 12 who have applied members of the senior management team or indeed senior members of the college? Yes. Are you prepared to say? I, um, I can't. I can't. It's not fair on those members of staff or the positioning of that. Uh, I'm discussing that with the Scottish Funding Council. We're filling in questions with them, dealing with it and moving it forward. I don't know if Clive might like to add to that. Uh, yes, we've got um, both the university in its role as strategic body um, um, is working with the fund and the funding council are actually working with the college and, and we've got a series of questions as well um, about what's being proposed. So that's still, that's still in discussion with the Funding Council at the minute. But if there are, are you at liberty to say what proportion of those 12 are from the senior management? Well, um, I, don't, I don't 
think so, really, no. I think I would want the Scottish Funding Council to advise me as to how I should proceed with that. I mean, I, for me to suggest that there are members of staff who may or may not be leaving at this stage, we don't know. We haven't got agreement from the Funding Council as to our proposals. Mm -hmm. So I think, it would be ex I think it would be very difficult and unfair on those members of staff. But it is fair to say that it, it is at least a possibility that in a situation which is considerably challenging, that some members of the senior management team who perhaps could be said to have got the college into this situation may be leaving with a large payoff in the not too distant future. Would that I be think fair? That, I'm afraid I disagree with that. I think that's extremely unfair. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the current senior management team uh, during that period did everything they possibly could to help including Anne herself, who stepped up to be vice principal when the principal was away and when the other principal was left. Um, you know, the board addressed the issues as, as far as I can see. And remember, I joined the board in August last year. Mm -hmm. um, I've been chair for a month, during which time I've done very little else but this, as you might expect. But the position, as far as I understand it, was that the senior management team very much stepped up to the mark, caught the problem where it was going wrong, the principal left, the vice principal, sorry, the, the financial director was managed out of the business. I, I, they, they then moved very quickly with UHI help to start remedying the position. And is it felt that the voluntary severance scheme of itself will work? I mean, if we accept that there will be some senior management going and some, uh, I guess, academic staff going. Uh, and, and support staff, yeah. And support staff. You see, th this concerns me because it, it rather strikes me that the end product that a college sells, if you like, is the ability to teach pupils. Can, so how can I you point you to your own figures at the start where you said that we had 72% of our income going on staff yes. and the average in Scotland is 63%. Yes. So we need to address that and we need to bring that in line with the other colleges and we're not allowed to go to make redundancies. We have to do it in, in, in this way and our ambition is, and I think you will see from our financial recovery plan, and already is achieving that. I accept that, except that you're, if the product is the provision of teaching, is the provision of education, is it possible, in your view, to cut the staff through a voluntary severance scheme without diminishing that product? I believe so. Have you done and the I'm, analysis? Is there a business oh, of, plan that... Of course we have. We have very detailed analysis which we've submitted to the Scottish Funding Council, every single individual. There is a, a business case to them. It shows where they sit. We've spoken to their curriculum leaders. We've dealt uh, internally to manage transition so that that is, is not an influence on the students. We've assured, we've spoken to and assured the unions that we wouldn't be doing any of these actions if we were um, unable to show that it would not impact on the students and the student experience. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, governance. Um, what is the size of the board of Murray College? Um, we're currently in transition. It was 18. We have three members who are at the point of resignation. The, the um, previous chair who was actually an acting chair for a year. He was the vice chair, Ash, um, who has now, or will leave, in, even in his principal, as, as vice chair at the end of this month. Um, and there are two other members of the board who are retiring. We interview next week for a further, um, well, we've got three candidates coming forward to fill places. We're not quite sure whether we wish to maintain the size of the board at 18 or gradually try and reduce it but we're trying to make sure that we've got a proper uh, transact in, in, in all classifications that we need on the board. 18 seems quite a large board. Yes, it does. It's a legacy that I've been left with, um, and it is something that we will strive to try and mm. 
amend. There are, in any board, there are those who don't appear to turn up from time to time. And we need to have a managed process of, of dealing with that, which, which we are putting in place. Looking back at the role of the, the board uh, over the last few years, during the difficulty, as the difficulties arose, did the board receive regular financial updates all the way through? Well, obviously, I wasn't there at that time as I joined the board in August last year. And my feeling is that it, it, it is probably a question for Murray. Yeah, I wasn't there either. But the evidence suggests that the quality of information and the timing of information was not what should have been expected by the board and by the Finance and General Purposes Committee. It was not adequate. I mean, looking as far back as 2014-15, the auditor was saying that uh, the uh, board and committee minutes didn't evidence decisions that were agreed. What was the point? The point of what? The point, the point, the point of minutes that don't actually say what's been agreed. I don't know. All I can say is it's, uh, it's not that way now. I can't I comment on that? the time. Can I mean, I obviously, we're that? trying I... to explore <clears throat> how this arose in the first place uh, and I... ensure that, obviously, it doesn't happen again. Uh, so I... we need to understand what went wrong, where the disconnects were. I, I couldn't agree more. There were failings. I, I, we don't have the evidence. The people who were there at the time are no longer there. They're no longer employed by the college. They're away from the institution. There's, I don't quite know how we get that evidence. We know that it was poor. Mm. Looking forward, I think uh, Murray Easton just said that uh, it's not that way now, that there are proper records kept, proper records of decisions taken. Is that, is that so? No, absolutely. The, I would not say that, there were, that the records kept at the time were not correct. The, the basic accounting information was sound. What we're talking about here is deficiencies in the process of sharing management information with the senior management team and with the board. And there was disparate information being shared in reporting to the SFC, different information being held on the accounting system for forecasts, not for the actual accounts themselves, and different information which was inconsistent and not given on a timely basis to the board. What we have in place now is uh, what I would call single data flow. It's a single set of um, financial information. And the primary purpose is to enable the, the management of the college to use that financial information to run the affairs of the college. The secondary aspects, that same core data set is used then to feed the Scottish Funding Council reporting requirements and also the needs and requirements of the board. And that is done on a timely basis. We have quarterly management accounts and we have an understanding of no surprises. So if anything comes out during the course of the quarter, rather than wait till the next meeting of the Finance Committee or the Board, that information is shared with relevant members by the Finance Director at the time to allow a, a live conversation to be had. Can I, can I also ask Murray just maybe to take us a little bit into the future? The financial recovery plan? No, the, the well, association. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I can ask a question. I'm still, I'm still looking at the historic side and trying to understand some of the aspects of that. At what point did uh, UHI become aware of the difficulties and what action was taken at that point? Um, we, I'll start off and then I'll ask Fiona to, to come in. We became aware in June 2015 um, and we had to make a cash advance to, to the college. Uh, at that time then, we took a report to our own Finance and General Purposes Committee, and then we wrote to the college asking for an explanation um, uh, as to what, how they got to that position and then asking for certain things to be done. Uh, so we engaged with the college very, very quickly, um, and we sought additional information. We needed, uh, we wanted a recovery plan. We wanted to look at what they were going to do to get themselves out of this position. Now, you, were, you became aware in, in June 2015 that there was a problem. There was difficulties at that time with the board getting financial information and dealing with the situation. What support did you give them? 
Um, we offered lots of support. We offered the support of our existing financial staff. We offered support at an individual level. Was that support well. accepted? Um, no, it wasn't. Uh, that was with the board that was existing at that time. It is a different board now. Uh -huh. Do we know why that assistance wasn't uh, accepted? Um, I can only speculate um, because I, I don't know what their, their thoughts are. But at that stage, we were transitioning from um, a, a structure where the, the relationship was directly with the Scottish Funding Council. And with the Post-16 Education Act, the university became the regional strategic body. And there was some um, resistance during that transition in terms of the relationships between the college, the regional strategic body, and the funding council at that time. But presumably the college didn't just say no. Presumably they said no because. Um, Fiona, do you want to? Well, um, what I would say is I, th I think it wasn't no because. I think it was much more that they felt that they, s they had the situation under control. And we had several meetings with the chair, board members, and senior staff with the, in the college accept, at that time. Did you accept that? They, we, continued to ask a lot of detailed questions for many months and information was provided on a um, not all, all the information we asked for wasn't provided at the time we asked for it but over several meetings we were able to get more information but certainly um, they resisted direct intervention by us at that stage so you just accepted that over a, over an extended period no, we didn't. Um, we pushed and we pushed as, as hard as we could to get that information, but the board um, at that time um, just was not willing to engage with, with the university or with the regional strategic body. Uh, but we did get that information. As Fiona said, we did. We managed to extract that information from them uh, and we got various data sets from the college. I mean, according to the, according to the audit report, the, the board of the college was struggling to get information. So the information they gave you must have been fairly limited. Um, you could say that, yes. Um, we, as, as an independent college, um, the board has a responsibility for ensuring that the, the information that they provide to the regional strategic body is correct. Mm -hmm. So we have to go with the information that's provided to us by the, by the college. But if you knew over an extended period that there was a problem, and you knew the college was refusing assistance, what did you do other than press them? Surely you escalated it up the line. We did, but we worked, we worked with the college and we did start to get the information out of them. And we had uh, a number of meetings with both the, the chair of the board at the time and the principal. Who did you escalate it to? Uh, we escalated that through to the Finance and General Purposes Committee of the university and then the university court. And outside um, the university? Yes, onto the Scottish Funding Council. The Scottish Funding Council. Yes. And what advice did they give you? Um, the Scottish Funding Council worked with us uh, to try to, to help the college as much as we could. So the SFC got in touch directly with the college? No, through UHI. Through UHI. Yeah. I'm well, trying to see any, here any where... Any letter that went to the, um, to the college was copied to us, so it was basically the, the Funding Council was um, So what did the Funding sure Council tell the college? That they were you concerned. saw the letter, so what did yeah. they tell the college? That they had to engage with you? Not so much in those words, um, but they, they said that, that the problem needed to be fixed and that as the regional strategic body, you know, we all have to work together to actually solve this, this issue. Does that seem a bit weak? You've got months of problems, you've got a board that's not engaging, you've got inadequate financial information, there's a deficit situation, college is looking for, fun, for funding, You've escalated it, and nothing. Well, I, I wouldn't say it was, uh, it was nothing. Uh, it just took a lot longer than we were hoping. The explanation that I would give for it is that um, at that stage, and when we've learned our lessons from that point, is that as we were transitioning from um, into the regional strategic body role, um, there were complications around relationships, and relationships were difficult at that time as to who was supposed to be talking to who. Um, since then, we have been, we've tightened up on that. We're getting much more regular financial information from all of the partners. 
Um, we uh, have put in place a number of new committee structures to have a much greater oversight. And we will probably be, or we will be, much more directive and interventional in the future, because I think that's our role as a regional Well, that would be the question. Do you not think at the time, if you'd been more decisive when the problem arose, that it could have been fixed a lot quicker? Um, potentially, yes. Uh, and I think that's a learning exercise for us as we transitioned into a regional body. Do you believe now, as a regional body, that you have that authority to intervene and direct the yes, colleges? we do. Um, because it seems to me that in the past you just escalated we have, the SFC and we, it we've also, made, we've also made changes to governance. I'm going to ask you, do you want to explain about the appointment now of the people on the board? I think... Um, to put it into context, in 14-15, um, we had just taken over the regional strategic body responsibilities on the 1st of August 2014. So, uh, at that stage, we had legacy boards in each <coughs> of our five incorporated colleges. Part of the, the post-16 Education Act provided that when the new boards came in, it was the U UHI as the regional strategic body that made the appointments of both the chairs the chairs of the colleges and also all the independent members, but that took quite a while to transition into the new boards. So at that stage, the Murray College Board was um, had been appointed by Murray College itself and had a, a feeling of autonomy and much greater independence from UHI than the current board would, because the current board members, and the chair and independent members are appointed by us. So that's been quite a major change, but there was also a legacy of not um, of, of regular finance information and performance information not being provided under the previous regime to UHI because all we funded in the previous part up until 2014 was higher education, whereas so it took quite some time uh, to work with the partners to get them to provide all the data that we now get on a very regular basis. Obviously, we can't ensure this doesn't happen again. You believe that you now have clear. Uh, one of a better word, guidelines as to how you would approach this again in the future and that it would be direct intervention at a much earlier stage, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly. The role of SFC doesn't seem to have backed you up in any particular uh, strength at the time you approached them with the original problem. Am I, am I wrong? Um, no, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't put it like that. Uh, I think there was a confusion over the relationships between the college, the regional strategy body and the Scottish Funding Council. Um, which so was the not, SFC was confused? Um, I think we were all unclear. Um, and I think also then that the, what, what didn't help was that at that time the board would continue to write to the Funding Council when the roles were shifting over to the regional strategic body. But you're satisfied that this would not be the case again yes, going I am. forward? Yes, we have put in, we've put in place what Fiona has said, and we've put in place other measures as well, uh, and we will be much more directive in the future. I would be interested, convener, to see a copy of these, uh, well, rules, guidelines. You say, you've, you say you've now got a process. That process presumably is uh, documented. Well, that process is, for example, it's through, at a governance level, it's through the appointment that Fiona has just talked about. Uh -huh. And then at an executive level, what we have done is we have changed the executive structure within the university, and we've created two new bodies. There's a partnership council, which has got all of the partners, the principals involved in that. And we start to scrutinize now much more closely what's happening in each of the partners. Mm. Uh, and then we have a new SMT that has got a number of the principals from the partners on that as well. Put that together then with the governance structure that we put in place. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, my high fever is playing up this morning. Um, so we put that in place then also with the new uh, <coughs> data sets that we're getting, we're much more confident that we have a better control over what's happening across the partnership. I hope that's not as bureaucratic as it sounds. Uh, but do, you, do you have a documented process for dealing with issues arising with colleges? Um, no, there's no specific protocol as such, because the, the issues that could arise in a college could be a multitude. We would probably spend, we'd spend all our time writing processes or writing protocols. I'm thinking um, in a particular case where a college is, is for want of a better word, failing. Yeah. Well, what we have, we do have a process in that, that the data set that we would use to examine that and the data that we would look at 
is considered at a number of levels, and then it's escalated. So it's considered at the SMT, it's considered at the Partnership Council, then it's escalated to the Finance and General Purposes Committee of the University, and then ultimately the court as the regional strategic body. But in addition to that, we also have a further educational regional board, which is made up of all of the chairs of the colleges. It's quite a complicated governance structure. Yes, it um, is. It is. Have you ever thought of simplifying it? Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> and are you going to? Um, we have looked, we have made changes to the, the governance structure within the limitations that we've got at the minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beattie. Uh, I think Jackie Bailey has, uh, wishes to carry on in that regard. Um, just a short uh, supplementary question, and it's to go back to the college <laughs> rather than UHI. Um, I think you would accept it's, it's not, and I'm sure you're not suggesting this, that this is simply down to one person. The board and the senior management team have responsibilities too. I entirely accept that the three gentlemen here um, you know, came after the event, and certainly in the case of Mr. Clinton, three weeks ago. So, so I appreciate asking you to answer for things you don't know about is difficult. But Anne Lindsay was there for the duration of that process and stepped up to the plate on at least one, if not two occasions, um, to take you know, the senior the position. And I wonder, therefore, if we could address some of those questions to you about what happened, what was done to fix the problems, and actually, what was the interaction between yourself, UHI, what did they ask of you, what did you do or not do in relation to those requests so that we get a fuller picture from somebody who was actually there? Thank you. Yes, uh, we had our principal in place from August 2014 until March 2015, so only in post eight months, and I personally wasn't in college some of that time, but um, that's not relevant. When I picked up the role in March 2015, it was fairly quickly clear to me that we didn't have the management financial information that we'd had previously. It was clear to me that there had been, as, as well as all of the other contributing factors that we, we've already discussed, which I don't think can be underestimated, to be fair, to the teams, um, we actually had also had that year an uh, unexpected significant drop in our HE student numbers. And we had, during that period, the August to the March, we had not in any way altered our budgets to... Um, line up with the fact that we would have had less income through less HE students. And that was really, from an operational point of view, that was the, the key uh, impact that actually caused the, the cash advance to, to be necessary. We really had not, for whatever reason, we had not altered the budgets. And our normal processes, we would, and, and now we obviously do before, now, but we also did before. Uh, obviously, the budgets are set on targets, and every September, October, once the student numbers are in, we realign our budgets, and uh, that has served us well in the past. And um, that year, we had a significant drop in HE students that wasn't recognised. Um, as soon as I um, became acting principal in March 2015, um, we instantly made an incredible number of changes to our budget control. There's no doubt about it. They, again, for whatever reason, it really had um, deteriorated <laughs> over a short period of time. And what I found, it was very, very difficult to actually ascertain our financial position. It did take us quite some time uh, working with our FD to establish where, where we were. Uh, we, that would not occur now, absolutely not, um, and it wouldn't have occurred prior to that, to be honest, either. But uh, it can't be underestimated just how long it took us to um, actually really forensically look at all of the accounts and all of the finances over that period of time. So that actually generally took time. To answer your question around um, UHI, as a member of the executive uh, I actually worked quite directly with uh, the Director of Finance of the UHI at the time and sought help um, in terms of best way forward. I also immediately contacted our internal and external auditors and I did contact the SFC directly because, as um, Fiona said, the, there was a, it was the emerging of, of regionalisation at that time, but SFC did tell me that my link was through the UHI and I was comfortable with that. 
So I did receive support directly from uh, the executive team at, at UHI, and that did, did help. How long did it take to get the finances in a position that, that there was a degree of clarity? I think we had uh, quite a bit of clarity by the by about the June July, uh, but in actual fact, the the following year, um, one would have expected. We, we immediately also improved the information we were giving to boards because I completely agree that the information given to the board between the August and the March was was not fit for purpose. Uh, so. I have to say, though, it wasn't so much, it wasn't inaccurate, it literally was just lacking in detail, and there had been minimum commentary. Uh, there was very little um, discussion on variances, etc. So we immediately improved the information that, that went to the boards. Again, though, I would say that that, that took a while. It, it really generally, um, over the 15 16, we were still identifying um, some financial issues which are in the, in the report that had a, an impact on our cash flow the following year. And um, it took us some time to, to recognise these. And also, we um, immediately, because of our financial situation, we immediately looked at, we went first to our non-staffing costs to try and uh, reduce these as much as possible, but obviously, uh, with the students' uh, service teaching being being paramount in in our heads at that time. It, just so I'm clear here, it took from, according to what you're saying to me, from March to June or July to get clarity, some to, clarity to get probably. initial clarity. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Initial clarity. We'll we'll agree to those terms. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, you were talking to the the board about this, mm -hmm. but actually, we then had the problem repeated for another year. I think that I think we continued to improve the information that was going to the board over that period okay. of time, but I would be accepting that it wasn't yeah. uh, totally sufficient until the new board were in place. So, so you required a cash advance of a similar magnitude the following year. So the problem we, remained. We did require a cash advance okay. uh, the following year. I think the one of the, the factors. Um, that caused that in actual fact was the fact that we'd had a 368k cash advance in 1415, uh -huh. and to be honest, that was a, a very large amount of money to have to pay back in in one year, and we always recognised that that may be actually difficult to achieve, and although I was surprised at the size of the cash advance we required the following year, we always considered that there might be a cash advance issue due to the fact that there had been 368k in the first year. Could can you clear up for me, and again, I might have misheard this, but, but I heard UHI say that the college didn't accept help, but you seem to indicate that you did. What's I, the truth? I personally received help from the executive, um, I, the board and its relationship with the um, Financial Purposes Committee of the UHI, I can't discuss. Yeah, that, yeah, there there was a, a I would say a good relationship with the executive and with and with Anne in particular. The real challenge was actually it came from the board, um, and that the pushback was coming from the board itself. Which I again to reiterate, that it's a different board to what we have today. I'll leave it there, convener. Thank you. I'm sure other members will pick this up. Thank you. Uh, just on that, um, <clears throat> just just so I'm absolutely clear, Fiona Larg said that the. There was various performance and financial information that wasn't being provided uh, to UHI to allow them to, to help, presumably. Uh, does that cross over with the period that you're talking about, Anne Lindsay? Uh, it, it does in the sense that the college were at that point, um, that was June 2015, the college were still trying at that point to ascertain all the financial management information that, that we had used to having. So it was the case that, uh, in, my, in my respect, it wasn't the fact that we were not willing to send the information. We generally had difficulty in actual fact extracting the information for quite some time. We did a forensic check of our entire finance system. We put incredible new systems into place. 
We, we changed our software, we changed the work of the finance team, we immediately had significant information at executive level for budgetary control, and to be honest, that was my primary aim, was to ensure that we, you know, we were in control of our budgets again, because we hadn't been, uh, in my view, for a while. So my primary aim was, in actual fact, to ensure that we had the budgetary information. In the sense of providing higher level information, we always provided what we had, but we weren't sometimes able to give justification or explanation as to why the figures were as they were. It was a dramatic uh, deterioration in a very short period of time. Okay, but Fiona Larg's evidence was along the lines of, we just weren't getting the information. What you seem to be saying is, we didn't have the information to give, and we were taking steps to remedy that. But why weren't you talking to UHI and saying to them, we haven't got this information for you? Because that wasn't what I understood from Fiona Lark. Well, again, I, I personally was in the sense that I was uh, discussing considerably with the Director of Finance of UHI, and they were some support in... I mean, I'm not an accountant, so they, they did in actual fact provide quite good financial support in um, going forward and what the key areas were, etc. So... I, I personally had a good relationship with UHI. Right. Uh, very briefly, just for the record. Oh, yes, of course, Murray. Could I just add a little bit of clarity that might be helpful? The, there is an obligation on the college to do quarterly financial returns to the Scottish Funding Council. Mm -hmm. Those returns were submitted and on time and would have been available to um, UHI themselves. So they would have had access to that level of information. The issue around it was whether the quality of the forecasts within those returns were appropriate and accurate, mm -hmm. or whether they were actually masking reality such that they had information, but it wasn't actually telling the story of what was happening within the college. And that appears to be what was happening. So there was information out there, but it may not have been appropriate and up-to-date. Right. Alex Neal. Can I just pursue some of this, please, and <coughs> um, Mr. Graham explained a litany of problems that all arose and seemed to arise quite suddenly. I mean, from what he's saying, the previous finance director uh, under whom this appeared to all happen appeared to serve the college well until this particular series events of events all seemed to happen at once. Um, did nobody think to... I mean, obviously, something had gone wrong, um, and I don't want to get into personalities, but did nobody think to suspend the finance director, given what you'd found out, and bring in a t at least someone from outside to get it sorted? Uh, did he remain the finance director throughout this period? The finance director, um, very shortly thereafter, went on sick leave. So was he replaced by a temporary post? Temporary post? Uh, eventually, but not for quite some time, because it wasn't initially established um, at what point he would be returning. But what we did do was we have uh, another accountant in the in the college, and she ha had her duties extended, and she uh, was in actual fact the one that led uh, us through the period of in actual fact um, getting back on track with all of our information. So we had a qualified accountant within the organisation. Uh, there is no doubt about it, though. Um, you know, we were under-resourced, and it was... I think one has to um, remember we're talking about 14, 15, and I generally don't think we can underestimate, uh, in terms of finance staff, the, the real impact yeah. of the various things that were happening at that time. We had regionalisation, we had the new reporting uh, framework, because we were uh, being reclassified by ONS uh, in terms of the, the college framework. We had a considerable change in, in that period. I think uh, my own reflection was that we, in finance, we perhaps spent too much time and too much priority on ensuring that all of the reports were returned to UHI stroke SFC all of the time, and perhaps not enough on what I would class as you know, the, core, the core finance role. Uh, I, there's an element of um, genuine so much change that, that at that time it was quite overwhelming. But I have to say that the staff that remained dealt with it all very, very well uh, immediately thereafter. Okay. Now, you said that when you 
were put in charge of things, you, um, you notified pretty quickly the auditors. I think you said the internal and the external auditors. So what did they do? Uh, my reason for informing them was to ensure that, you know, that Murray's problem was, was well known because obviously that was paramount for me, was ensuring that um, we let everybody know that we did have these problems. And uh, both sets of uh, auditors were, were generally very supportive. I had great discussions with them, talked through different strategies in terms of financial recovery. We talked about priorities and, of course, the priority was... Uh, budgetary control at that time it was it was lacking so both uh, both sets of auditors um, provided quite a bit of support in in that very brief uh, time scale initially but then what uh, we did what I did was that uh, once we had uh, resolved our budgetary control issues and we had implemented them and we had uh, a period of time lapse about six months I think, uh, I asked the internal auditors to come in and do a specific audit uh, on budgetary control and on uh, a cash flow, et cetera, to ensure that, one, that what we had put into place was fit for purpose and effective, and two, the natural fact that it, we were implementing it you know, to our own procedures. And although at that time, I think there was one or two recommendations to, to help us improve further, uh, overall, the internal auditors um, were satisfied that we were we were back on track, so to speak. Good. And you notified the SFC. What support did they provide? Uh, I, I contacted the SFC directly because, as I say, at that time, we were just literally um, forming the region of the Highlands and Islands in terms of FE. And uh, their response to me was, in, due to digitalisation, I now had to to contact UHI instead. So I had already done that, to be honest, and then continued so after that. So they backed it back to UHI, basically? Yes. Mm -hmm. And really didn't, and left it at that, did they? Did they come back to check three months later? No, no I mean, no we, uh, as Murray SFC? says, we continuously re returned all the reports. We, we never missed a report. We returned no. all the reports all of the time, but no, they didn't come back. They didn't come back at all? No, the UHI. Um, right. Yeah. They were very hands-off. SFC. SFC? Oh, absolutely. Right. OK. Can I kind of widen this out a bit? Because, um, obviously, the Highlands and Islands is a very unique arrangement, uh, given that we've got the Highlands and Islands University made up of the 13 colleges, which are also uh, FE colleges, uh, in effect. And it seems to me, just building on what uh, Colin Beatty said, um, if you start for example, at this college, you had the Finance and General Purposes Committee. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you had the board. Then you've got UHI. And within that, you've got, now got a partnership board and you've got various other boards, um, as well as full-time staff and so on, and the new appointee. And then at the top of the tree, we've got the SFC. Um, I, I mean, it's little wonder that uh, there is... Mayhem, is it not? I mean, many bodies are involved in this. I mean, it must um, be you know, a, a very bureaucratic and slow process with that number of people involved. Yeah. And, and in answering, Clive, could you tell me, you know, what is the role in the Highlands and Islands, respectively, of the SFC, UHI, or the, the college, regional college board, and the colleges, how much, you know, autonomy have the colleges got? Um, where do you come in and the SFC it doesn't? And where do they come in to tell you what to do? You know, what sanctions have you got if a principal or a board of a college uh, decides that, you know, they don't agree with you? What, what sanction have you got, if any, to impose that your point of view? Um, I, I wouldn't quite say it's mayhem. I would say it's very, very complicated. Um, I mean, UHI itself is unique. It's a, it's, it's a very, very different sort of university. And it was the only way um, they could actually create a university presence in the Highlands and Islands by, by bringing these colleges yeah. together. So we're a, we're a federal university. So we're federated with, with the individual colleges. Um, we, have a, we have a number of relationships with them. And this is where it gets complicated again, in that um, as a university, 
the 13 colleges are academic partners of the university, so they deliver the higher education element. So there's a partnership arrangement. But the university is also now a regional strategic body for the further education funding as well. So we play a number of roles, in that, and that can be quite difficult to politically work your way through, particularly when you have a, um, an area that covers an area bigger than Belgium. So you're going from the Shetland Islands all the way down to Argyll, where the pressures in the, and the challenges in each one of those locations are very, very different. So we have a, we have a, a, a challenging position there in itself. Then what we had to do was to figure out, um, in terms of, and this is the creation of the university, is that um, there was no location anywhere in the Highlands and Islands that would have the critical mass necessary to create a university. But by bringing them all together, um, we were able to create what is, in effect, the University of the Highlands and Islands, which has performed incredibly well. And if you look back at the last uh, research exercise, excellence exercise, we performed incredibly well for a university that's only four or five years old. Now, we are young, we're growing, uh, we're developing, we've still got a lot to learn. We have the complications of that. We've got the complications of the regional strategic body coming in in 2015-16. So we've had to work our way and feel our way through that because when, um, unlike a traditional university um, or a single institution with a single governance structure, where you may be able to uh, be very, very directive, in a federated relationship, you have to, in a lot of cases, bring people with you. So, so we have the, the, the geopolitical dimension to the partnership as well. Um, my personal view is that over a period of time, the governance structures will change. Um, how long that will be, I'm not clear, because it will depend on how fast um, there is an appetite for change. Uh, but it is a very complicated structure. Um, I have been in the Highlands and Islands three years now. Uh, I don't claim to understand the politics completely. <laughs> Uh, but it took me about a year and a half to actually start to understand how the relationships all work. Is there not a built-in conflict of interest between, you know, at the university? Because, you know, the, the role of higher and further education is quite distinct. And obviously the colleges are involved in both further and higher education. And you're now acting as the, the regional college board as well as the university. I mean, it's a two-headed monster, isn't it? Um, we, we've actually turned it round on its head. We actually see this as an opportunity because what we are is we are the first tertiary university in the UK. So we cover both further education yeah. and higher education. Yeah. So we're very proud of that, the fact that we are tertiary. And we're breaking down a lot of the barriers around traditional education and the separation between further and higher education. Yeah. Half of our higher education students come through a vocational <coughs> Yeah. and who then want to go on. So we see that as very distinctive, and um, we see ourselves as mapping very closely against the learner journey, you know, and the students, and putting the students at the centre. So we see ourselves as doing things that are very different. The problem we have is that then we come up against barriers because the structures are all set up for further education or higher education. So we, we, we get difficulties when it comes to that. And, and that really leads on to my next question. Has the time really not come to recognise that you are a different beast from the rest of the higher and the rest of the further education system? And have, would it not be much more effective just a one unified management structure uh, recognising the reality of the situation, perhaps with local boards looking at specifically local issues? But, but have we not created... Um, an unnecessarily complicated uh, situation where, you know, it's very difficult for anybody to really be in control, particularly when something goes wrong. It seems to be getting batted from pillar to, pillar to post. That is one option. Um, and there are a number of other options that, that could be looked at as well to simplify. And we are looking at simplifying that. For example, we've just gone through a period there where we had a, a strategy working group from across the partnership and we've agreed changes that we hope will simplify and clarify um, where the accountability sits. So we've now done that, and we've, we've basically signed uh, an agreement between all 13 partners that, that this is the, the processes, and this is where the accountability sits, and this is where responsibility and decision-making. So we're started on that journey. Yeah. Um, where that journey will end up, I'm not sure. Um, I suspect that it'll be after my tenure as principal. Um, uh, to clarify, the SFC, the SFC obviously give you a budget as a university. 
basically from the higher education funding. In terms of further education, does the SFC still give money? Do they give it to the board for distribution or do they specify how much each of the 13 colleges are going to get? What we do is um, we have two funding streams. One is the higher education funding stream, which is similar to any other university. Yep. And then we have a further education funding stream, which is similar to any other college. They both come into the institution. Um, the higher education budget is managed through the court as normal. But because we've also got responsibility as a regional strategic body, we have set up a committee which is called the Further Education Regional Board. And that's a committee of court. And their responsibility then is to manage the further education budget on a regional basis. So the money comes into the region. Yeah, it comes into the region. I, I, I hear the point about managing it, but who do you allocate? Do you allocate the money between the colleges? Do you decide how much money Murray, a Murray College is getting? In essence, yes. Uh, the Further Educational Regional Board, acting as the regional strategic body, um, allocates it on a regional basis. Right. Um, and so they that could, we, and they could get funding from your higher education budget as well, obviously. The sorry, the I'm colleges, not clear. Presum the presumably, the colleges do higher as well as further. The colleges education. get two income streams. Right. They get a further education and a higher ed education income stream from the right. university. Right. Okay. Um, and and how long do you expect to be there? How long? How long do you think your tenure will be? Um, I'm hoping as, as long as I keep performing well, I, I like to think I'll be here for a no, period of time. It's not, it's not in terms of really your personality. You, you've given the impression that you doubt if much will change uh, even in your time. No, I think what I was trying to say was that um, the timescales, things move quite slowly in the Highlands. Um, and I, it could be, I don't know, it, it could happen in the next few months if it was... So to be, or it could, it could take three, four, five, six, seven years. Does it not require some national leadership to drive the change? Um, potentially, yes. I think any political support would, would be great. Yeah. Um, well, well, given what we've seen, not, and it's not just in this college, there's at least one other college out of the 13, and we're seeing them later, who've had other problems. Um, but it just seems sitting here, an unnecessarily bureaucratic, complicated, you know, arrangement uh, that could be simplified, and the opportunity to take a more innovative approach uh, to have a more unified higher and edu higher and further education system in the islands and islands, which uh, I would have thought would be very much in tune with what the needs are of the highlands and islands community. I think anything that simplifies the the system w would be welcome. Uh, I think I would say that yes, we are hugely complicated beast. But what I would say is, if you look at the achievements of the institution over the last 10 years, and it's only had university titles for four years, we've just been awarded research degree awarding powers last week by the Privy Council. Uh, so we're clearly demonstrating. Yeah. Now, I think we could do a lot better. Um, and that will be the challenge for us in the next five to 10 years, is how do we build on that foundation? Yeah. Uh, so anything that simplifies it and makes it easier for us to do that would be welcome. So my final question is, if a similar situation arose in any of the 13 colleges in the future, uh, do you feel as though you're now equipped to deal with the situation quickly and to expedite the solutions that you think are required um, quickly, timidly? We have better information. We've got more accurate information. We'll get it in a better time. And the university now is clearer in terms of its role as a regional strategic body. So in the future, we would be much more directive and interventionist. And, and you have the necessary powers to do that. Okay. okay, thank you. A very quick matter arising from Mr. Neil's line of questioning. Uh, presumably then, you could absorb some of the financial difficulties created by, let's say, Murray College by taking budget from Lose Castle budget and sending it to them, couldn't you? Um, in theory, we could. I don't think Lose Castle would be very pleased about that. What we have is we have a, we have a mechanism, a model for funding, um, which we have inherited from the Funding Council as we became a regional strategic body. So what we've been doing is we've been transitioning uh, into a model that we think is more appropriate for the Highlands and Islands because. The best people to make the judgment about what's needed in the Highlands and Islands are the people that are in the Highlands and Islands. So that's the, um, the boards and the universities and the colleges working together. 
So we have been funded on a regional basis, and, and our role is to provide the regional educational opportunities. So we can move funding around, and we can change the model to, to incentivize and to deliver in areas where there's need. So yes, we, we can do that. But when one college needs a cash advance, there's only a finite pot of cash. So you have to pull it from somewhere else in the budget. And we have pulled that out of the university because the university ha is able to have reserves through the higher education, for, through the further education aspect of it, there is no reserves. But we can use higher education uh, reserves, which the university and the partners have all earned, we can use that to support. Thing. But the key challenge is not just providing the cash advance, it's determining what the root causes are and trying to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. I accept that, but just to be absolutely clear, if a college requires a cash advance to make it sustainable, you will use university reserves to make that advance? Yes, we can use that. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll just begin by going slightly backwards. Um, Peter Graham, at the beginning, you were quite frank in setting out um, what the, well, you painted a picture of, of what had gone before, and it was pretty chaotic and, and dysfunctional, I think. Um, everyone would agree. Now, I'm keen to, to hear what lessons have been learned and, and what difference really the new board is making and the new senior executive team. Um, and Lindsay, it's fair to say you're the only person on the panel who's been there throughout. So I wonder if you can perhaps say in your own words what the culture had been like in the college. Um, what it, um, if it did change at this a peak a chaos period, what that change was, and how you, um, now that you've stepped up to be the most senior person, what you've brought in terms of leadership qualities and expertise to, to go about changing that culture? Of course, I think it has to be recognised that since February 2016, we have a, a new principal, David Patterson, who's unable to be with us today. And if he was here, I think he would be informing you that we have... Uh, done substantial work towards our new strategic plan. We have worked with our staff, uh, consulted with the staff, our stakeholders, various uh, groups, etc., to take that forward. A key part of that strategic plan is values, communication, uh, culture, support for students. Um, but in terms of the finances, which you know we're, we're discussing today, we have um, really for... Uh, 18 months, perhaps longer, been working on looking at our financial recovery plan to, now that we know our, our baseline, now we know where we are, to take forward our financial recovery plan. That financial recovery plan is really two streams. It's based on growth, both through the university. Uh, we've got uh, at least two new degrees uh, we're developing just now, which obviously we would be sharing with our partners. So, And we have other... Um, plans to grow our HE numbers. We've also, in terms of growth, we're looking to uh, increase our uh, commercial income because uh, we feel that in the current environment we, we need to do that. Uh, and, and we've been looking at various projects to take forward to, to increase our income uh, outside, outside grant. And also we've had to um, look at uh, reducing our costs because it was clear that our staffing costs are too high and although it wasn't our first consideration, we did very much try to uh, revisit the, you know, the funding model to, to, see if we're, um, to see if we could get more funding. Uh, however, we are where we are and I think that um, the... VSS scheme that we, we have in place just now is one way, it's one method. In actual fact, I was looking at our staff uh, costs, but in actual fact, in the last 18 months, 15 months, our staffing has uh, steadily reduced because we've been looking at vacancies. We've not been filling vacancies to the same extent, but we do have some very strict parameters we use for that. Uh, students, the impact upon students, impact upon staff, and impact upon service delivery. Okay, I appreciate your, your very expansive answer. I was keen to stick initially on and looking back at some of the behavioural issues because I, I really want to be satisfied that, that the right skills and the right people are now in place. So I wonder, and from, from your experience of that, if you can perhaps say 
what was lacking perhaps in the previous board in terms of skills and if you're confident that the, the new board has the necessary skills to be effective in its role. With regards to the board of management? The board, yes. Yes. Um, I certainly have uh, welcome and uh, noticed a, a significant difference in the, the new board that was actually formed last August. I've only recently in actual fact, been attending meetings because uh, until our principal actually went off on, on sick leave, but uh, for example, we've, I've just had two Finance General Purposes Committee. They were very rigorous. They were very um, detailed. We talked a lot about current position. We talked a lot about where we sat with regards to the financial recovery plan. Um, the board are very supportive. Um, uh, but th there is a, a, an element of rigour, yes. Mm -hmm. So can you see what was perhaps missing before in terms of skills and experience and, and what the difference is? You mean you've talked in quite general terms here, but I'm looking for maybe some examples about the type of people who were on the board and what their um, CV brought to the, the role. I, I, I think in terms of finance, perhaps there's more um, knowledge and experience of finance matters on the board now. Than, than there were before. I think I think the, the previous board would, would have recognised that. Um, so. Okay. Well, perhaps I can yeah. Can I just pick offer up a little Peter bit of and, and Murray just in terms yeah. of um, what you think might have been lacking before? Yeah. Can and I just offer a, Sure. If I can just ask the questions, please. What you're bringing to the board? Yeah. Just a little bit of clarity. The picture I see when when I look back from what I've seen and read and understand from conversations wasn't necessarily a chaotic situation. It wasn't necessarily, there was nothing to suggest that the books and records of the, the college were, were not being properly maintained, nor that the procedures generally were inappropriate, nor anything about the capability of the board. What we had here was, if you, if you strip away all the other issues, what we had here, and it's 2014-15, I know it's come out of the audit report for 15-16, but the root cause was 14-15. And if you strip everything else away about process, procedures and people, what you actually have is that the financial model, the financial framework under which the college was operating had broken down. And that was the root issue, not the cause, but the, the issue. In simple terms, we got to a position where the cost base was exceeding the total income, which is provided by funding and commercial income generated by the college. And that had broken. And that was what gave rise to the need for an advance at the end of 2014 of £368,000. The issue around it was that the quality of information was poor and not being fairly and timely presented, so that then the secondary lines of defence, outside of management who were primarily responsible, the secondary lines of defence, namely the board and finance committee, UHI, auditors, the SFC themselves, were not able to see the issue unfold as it happened. It was only once we got to the end of the year that the size of the financial hole became real, and that's when people reacted. It could and should have been picked up earlier, it wasn't. By that time, the cash flow was negative. We had an end of year cash deficit, and two things need to happen at that point. One, you've got to try to fix the budget model so that you're actually generating positive cash, and then you've got to address the hole that you have already created. And if you don't do that, it gets worse, and that's what happened in 15, 16. The size of the hole grew from 368 to an advance of 568. And what we have done now, the rest of it was just about awareness and then resolution. And what we now have is a financial recovery plan that has addressed, that has changed the business model for the, for the college. We now have a plan going forward, a two and a half year plan that by the end of, um, not the academic year ahead, but the following one, we will be in positive income and generating positive cash flow. And that was a core issue that needed to be fixed. It wasn't just about chaotic context. Mm -hmm. The underlying financial model was broken, and that's what management with the current board have addressed, and we're already mm -hmm. halfway towards achieving the okay. recovery plan. Wouldn't uh, a competent team have picked up these problems earlier? Absolutely, but what I'm saying is, within the senior management team, I would expect the principal and the finance director at the time to be sharing that information with a wider senior management team and with their <laughs> finance committee and the board. And that's what did not appear to happen. 
sharing of the up-to-date situation, sharing the bad news, understanding what the extent of the problem was and why, and if you could address it earlier, the size of the hole would not have continually grown deeper and deeper. Thank you. Can, can I come back to your yes. question <clears throat> relating to... As it, obviously, I'll let you in, but uh, can I ask the witnesses to keep answers quite short and concise just now as we're yeah. getting on in time? Thank can, you. Can I come back to your question about the sort of ethos in the board? What you'd had and what Clive is having to work with in the UHI throughout all of the colleges is an historical setup which was pre the, the revised the revised agriculture, the revised education act, and so you had a team of people who were in there who'd been there for quite a long time who. Complacent would be too strong, but they were relaxed and comfortable with the FD and the situations that were going on. What's, what Clive has now got, particularly at Murray College, and probably as a result of this, is a board who are much more structured towards looking towards the UHI, who are much more structured to looking towards the future in the, that relationship. We're already discussing an, a unified uh, accountancy package, which will be structured through from UHI, and you can see centralised services coming out of it, which gives you some of the savings you're looking for. But for, for you to impose change to those college boards, I suspect will meet resistance. And at the moment, I've been to a couple of these sort of FERB meetings, even my role as new chairman. You're getting people who are, who are stuck in their little their little class, and they're saying, I want, I want, I want, instead of, look, we're all in this together. We need to work this pie so that it's to the advantage of all. And, and that is the, probably the biggest significant change on the board at Murray College, is this willingness to move into the future in a proper and managed relationship with the UHI the openness of the bookkeeping, the interrelationship between our fin new financial director, he's already been in his last two weeks into the UHI meeting, meeting with the FD of the UHI. You know, we've already discussed how we intend to move forward our finances. So, so these, these ethos changes, which is I think what you were asking about, yes. are so significant because we're new to the game. We're not looking at the history. We're not burdened down by the relationships that there were historically. And we've come in with a view. Uh, the reason I've applied is because I want Murray College to be part, like, like um, Maudlin is to Cambridge or yeah. something like that. I think what I was just hoping to hear is that, that there has been that look back to the past so that, that lessons have been learned and the same mistakes won't be repeated. Does, does that give you that answer to that? I, I think we're, we're getting there. Thank you. Mr Clinton, uh, congratulations on your new job. We haven't heard from you yet. Um, the auditor found that the, the management accounts um, did analyse the areas of overspend but did not provide explanations for the variances between budgets and forecasts and also there was a lack of audit trails. Can you reassure us today that this has all been um, improved upon and we won't see that uh, complaint again? Um, yeah, I mean, by, by what I've seen so far, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, like I say, I've just kind of in the door in a matter, matter of weeks, so I've kind of come in at a point where there were management accounts getting prepared and then looking at the budgets going forwards. Um, but there certainly is a narrative there in place that wasn't before, but from what I can see, I'd be looking to kind of expand on that and working very closely with F and GP to understand what they want um, looking at the reasons why, not just saying this is up, this is down, and that's a percentage of it, to, to do some analysis and actually dig into it to find out, well, what, what is going on there? Do we need to be taking action? Do we need to be concerned? And as Murray mentioned earlier, we're, we're by the boards may meet quarterly or so. Um, there is going to be, or there is, a very direct line of communication whereby I'll be in contact with Murray or the board if there is anything that I feel you know, needs examined, needs to be brought to the board's attention. Um, and we'll certainly be in, ensuring that going forward, the, the board pack, the information um, is robust, sound, and, you know, ha has the, has the um, narrative to, to go along with it. So what are you going to do differently from your predecessors? Uh, pr probably everything, <laughs> to be fair, if we're looking at kind of what had not, not happened going back then. Um, but really looking to understand the, the dynamics of the college and where the issues are. Uh, clearly, we've got a financial recovery plan that we're working to. Um, one of the big challenges and areas to focus on is the non-funded income. Um, that's very much kind of at the forefront of my thinking. Um, 
at a recent board meeting, we have decided that there will be a, a like a committee set up, which I'll be chairing, to look at you know getting new ideas to generate income, uh, pulling that, pushing it forward, and actually putting the emphasis out there on the on the budget holders. They need to be thinking about this as well as just I, I need this, but we need to be having a more commercial out, out view on things. Can I ask? I think I can't remember who said it, but um, one of the witnesses this morning said it had been quite difficult to, to repay the, the previous advance, um, you know, all in one go. Um, the, the most recent advance is almost £700,000. When is that to be paid back? Is that part of the recovery plan? Um, as far as I've seen, yes. I mean, I know there is staggered payments going back, um, looking at the cash flows that are down, done monthly. Um, but that, that is all kind of built into the financial recovery plan and pretty I'm at the infancy of, of kind of getting into the detail of everything just now. Um, but is that, that going to that, place a burden on the, the college's books? Or Mr Easton, I think, is nodding. Is it, is it achievable to pay that back in one year? Yeah, I, I, by, by the projections that we're looking at just now and based on what's gone into the recovery plan, um, I'd, 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 I'd make the assumption that yes, but clearly until I'm right into the detail, I couldn't give you a kind of solid um, black or white answer. Okay. One of the other things I'd, I'd picked up from the, the Audit Scotland report is that um, a decision had been taken to delay property repairs um, as a sort of short-term funding um, measure. Now, Mr Clinton, would you not be concerned that that might lead to increased costs in the future, um, you know, if you put off repairing leaky roofs, for example, um, and what impact will that have on the, the, the value of, of assets going forward? I mean, potentially, but I mean, I'm, I don't really have the, the background knowledge of what was or wasn't done and kind of capital expenditure or maintaining buildings. Sure, um, but there's some risks thrown up if you're putting off repairs. Potentially, potentially, yeah. Can okay. I say that there has been a substantial amount of maintenance work done on our... We have a very ageing building, of course, and uh, it is expensive to maintain. But we have this year spent a considerable amount of time, uh, money um, improving. We've refloored corridors, we've done a lot of painting, we've done a lot of repair work, um, we've put in new fire risk assessment work. Um, there's been quite a bit of money spent this year on, on capital uh, and maintenance. Okay. What kinds of repairs have been put on hold? Uh, I don't think we've, we, we actually have a, a we have a long term uh, maintenance plan, and to be honest, it's it's on schedule. Um, we have some work that we're planning again to to do next year once we we have our capital maintenance funds for for next year. So I, I wouldn't say that we're actually behind our maintenance plan. I think where we are in terms of our building is that it is hugely uh, costly in actual fact to bring it up to what we would like like to see to the extent that. Uh, our funding will never cover that, to be honest. We, we just have to ensure that we, we do the best for our students and our staff and, and of course, health and safety, etc. So we do have a, a, a routine maintenance plan that our Head of States uh, delivers upon. Um, but yes, it's an expensive building to maintain. Mm. Okay, so what, what bearing does that have on the student experience? There's probably lots of... Um, investments and upgrades that you would like to do to really enhance the, the student experience. Um, is, is that a concern that you have? Well, I think any college would love to do more for, for its students. Um, in, in saying that, uh, and I know it's not the end, but we meet with our students regularly. We have very good relationships with our students, close links through many, many routes. Um, but we have just finished our uh, learner survey of the year and uh, we're always very appreciative of the, the high praise that, that we receive from these from these surveys, etc. But we would also know through through other channels. Okay. Um, just a final question from me, convener. Um, perhaps Mr Clinton and Mr Graham could pick this up. National bargaining. Um, I just wondered what recent discussions you've had about um, any financial implications around the, the national bargaining commitments. Um, on pay harmonisation, terms of conditions, etc. As, as, as we've already heard, the funding to the college comes from the UHI. They are our Scottish Funding Council in effect now. And we are discussing with them the impact of national bargaining and we are waiting to hear whether or not additional funding is going to be <coughs> given to...
to us in relation to that, but we've certainly taken it into account in our budget for next year, which we're in the process of, of moving forward, and we're waiting to hear whether or not we're going to get funding, which <coughs> at the moment I don't think a decision's been taken on whether the colleges are. There, there's been sort of press releases and so on, but I'm... I, I'm I mean, I think there's even been some this morning, but Clive, you're probably more up to date on that than I well, am. Well, just before we move on to, to, to Clive, um, how much do you need? 414,000. 400,000. 400,000. Is that for, for, for year, year one? For next year. Yeah. Okay, and what about for subsequent years, years two and three? Who knows? You don't know, okay. Mr Mulholland, do you want to add to that? Um, the only thing I could add is that obviously the, the funding that the college receives comes from the government through us, so, so I can't magic up any extra income as such. Um, all I will say is that we have been working across the partnership, modelling different things, looking at the impact on that. Um, and it's a, it's a process that I think um, is, from a personal perspective, I think is the right thing to do. Uh, and we've just, as all organisations, we will have to actually figure out how we manage that as we go forward. But until we find out what the final outcome is, mm -hmm. um, it, it's sort of guessing in the dark at the minute. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, national bargaining, you know, is happening. It's, it's settled. Um, colleges will have to deliver on it as em employers. If the Scottish government doesn't inject more money into the system to, to cover that, and I think colleges Scotland are on record saying that. They have concerns about the affordability. If you have to pick up the tab yourselves, is that going to create some financial difficulties? Again, I'm looking at you, Mr Clinton. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you, you simply couldn't just add that into your cost base without having additional income. Um, but what, what would suffer as a result? Because it is, it's national policy. It's going to have to be delivered. Hmm. What would um, suffer as a consequence if you don't get that additional <laughs> money? I suppose you'd need to revisit the financial recovery plan um, and again discussing that with, with board, um, the other senior management and, and UHI to okay. see. But is that a risk that you're alive to being very new in the in the role? Yes, yep. yeah. It's well it's impossible not to be aware of, of it as it's going on, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Willie you. Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I'd like to get back to the actual report and the scope of the the Auditor General's report on the college performance to date. Um it was mentioned by the convener and others, and I think Mr Graham, that the proportion of staff cost, staff budget was 72% at this college. Scottish average is 63%. But the forecast is that the staff cost ratio will go up to 78%. Is that accurate? And is that part of your financial recovery plan? It's, it's not accurate. We've right. moved on since then with the recovery plan. I don't know where the actual percentages will be, but we did benchmarking exercises that suggested our support staff was too high. Our mm. academic staff were <coughs> roughly in line with other equivalent benchmarks. We have already, from the beginning of this academic year, started with a, a staff base of 249 full-time equivalents. The last forecast we had for the average for the year had brought that down to 239, and that's now coming down to 234. So we've, we've made significant in, uh, inroads into reducing the, the payroll budget. Now, the numbers they, that you gave me don't particularly help. The information I have here says that Murray College, the staff cost budget is 72% of gross expenditure. The Scottish average is 63 Is Murray College staff cost higher than the Scottish average? Would you say? Give, given yes. the interventions we've made this year and a reduction of 15 FTEs, I don't know what that will bring it down to, but I know that it will bring us down well within the benchmark levels for other equivalents, and I suggest we be back in line with or below what the average was. OK. There, there's, a, there's another statement here that says staff costs will increase to 78% of gross budget, so you're categorically saying that's not the case. That's the information okay, now. It's been can, superseded. We can check that with others and we can yeah. come back to that. Could, could, could I start at the current position and look forward and give you a chance to, to tell us how things are going? Um, the recovery plan's in place, I presume. Um, has everyone happy with it? Has UHI seen it? Has the Funding Council seen it? Is it approved? Is it in place? And what's likely to happen in the next year? Yes to all of the above. And the financial recovery that we have made this year, we started up with a, an opening draft showing a bottom-up deficit without any intervention of 967, which was even greater than the deficit of around 800 for the last two years. 
By the time the recovery plan was put in place, which is around the end of the year, we had driven that deficit down for the current year to about 606. The last forecast, and this is with ongoing interventions and actions being fulfilled during the course of the current academic year, the forecast in March had dropped the deficit to 515, and the so latest one that Nick presented 000. is now 460. So we've halved the these deficit. Are, these are hundreds of thousands of years. That's right, right. that's right. Going forward, we're primarily dependent on the, the satisfactory support of the VS scheme. And if that does come through, we expect it will give us of the order in full about 350,000. So you can see then that the deficit going forward year on year, all things being equal, would drop to around 100,000 by next year. And we're planning to close that gap by further interventions within the college, largely around commercial income and other initiatives. Good. And that would take us back to 1718. We're projecting a deficit of only 150. And then by the, the following year, down to around minus 50 or even zero. Okay. Um, and we're halfway there already. Well, it's good to hear this. Could, could I hear the UHI's assessment of the recovery plan and whether you're yes. satisfied with it? We've, we've looked at it and we have, we have a, approved that in general. However, what we are doing, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about being much more interventionist. Um, we are now going to put a, a support project board in place with the college to work with the college um, so that they can have additional expertise and, and we can have uh, increased confidence that the, the recovery plan will be delivered. So, for example, um, Anne, I think, was mentioned about growth in new curriculum. Um, we would want to be very much involved in that and helping to guide and have that expertise to guide because you need to grow your income as well as manage your cost base. So we will have that a much closer um, hands-on relationship with the college going forward. Um, and you mentioned some of the growth plans, um, you know, planning to grow the HG numbers, but you also said just before that that one of the causes of the financial difficulty was a drop in HG student numbers. So. What's happening now? Is you getting more HE students coming back? Or is it that was actually genuinely one year which was very unexpected. We had a, a downturn the, the following year, 15-16, we actually had a significant increase in HE numbers. In fact, we had record numbers of both HE and FE students the following year. So, uh, And we are currently, our uh, activity levels are beyond target on FE. So of the 18 and 7 credit target, we're delivering over 19,000, so we're very comfortable in terms of the, the student numbers, and it generally was one year, uh, unexpectedly, our HE numbers dropped, and as I said, the following year, there was a significant increase. Good, good. Uh, are your, your forecasts uh, based on, say, 100% achievement of your aims in the recovery plan, for example? You also <laughs> mentioned commercial income. Have you factored that into the recovery plan and assumed that you're going to get all of it? No, we've passed a judgment on it. As to, we've, we've made an assessment of what is possible okay. and, mm -hmm. and risked that and put in a certain proportion. It's around half of what we think is possible. Okay, and, and your assessment of the, the recovery plan is, is acceptable? Yes. It's, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to wrap up, just three very quick areas. Uh, just so I'm clear about the current structure, uh, there was a new principle taken on in March 2016. Uh, who's currently on long-term sick leave? He has been absent in the college since uh, April. Uh, long term, no. He's had an operation, a, a fairly serious operation, mm -hmm. and he was told at the time that he was expected to be away for six to nine, ten weeks. It's actually looking it's going to be slightly longer than that, mm -hmm. but we are hoping to see him back in a part-time capacity within the next couple of weeks, building up to full time probably by the end of July. Uh, and reporting into him is yourself as assistant principal and Lindsay and yes, another, uh, which is Tom McGarry. Yeah. So presumably you'll be very important. Uh, the assistant principals will be very important driving this process forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than the previous Director of Finance, who we heard about earlier, has anyone else left the college as a result of the performance and finance issues, whether by settlement agreement or otherwise? Um, a number of board members. But uh, no was one... The, the, not, was the, what was the cause of the principal leaving? Um, yes. It was direct, was it? It was... Managed, yes. That, that was going to be my next question. The previous principal, 
Uh, the, the one I think he was in for seven there's or eight a, months. There's a compromise agreement around the, the termination, the, the departure of the last principal. Right. So, okay, so the, the, the last principal left under a settlement agreement, the director of finance left under a settlement agreement. Yep. Anyone else? I, I don't, no. I'm not aware of anyone else. I, I wasn't there, but, but I'm, I haven't heard of anyone else. No, I'm not aware of any. I, I, I can't recall, but absolutely, I, I don't recall anybody, no. no. Okay. Uh, thank you for your evidence. Thank you very much for coming along today. Uh, I'll now suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much and good morning again. For item three, we'll take further evidence on the 2015-16 audit of Lewes Castle College, which is based in the Outer Hebrides. Uh, I welcome Ian McMillan, the principal of the college, and I welcome back Clive Mulholland and Fiona Larg of the University of Highlands and Islands. As with Murray College, just for clarification, the UHI is the regional strategic body for Lewes College. I'll briefly set out some background to this evidence session. Lewes College has failed to meet its further education targets for eight years, albeit by a small margin, uh, and with extenuating circumstances in some cases. In one of those years, according to the Auditor General's report, the Scottish Funding Council, or the UHI, did seek to recover funding from the college. Uh, so we will be exploring how the college spent the public money it received for activity it apparently did not deliver, 
what role the UHI played in supporting or challenging the college, the impact of Lou's underperformance on other colleges within the UHI region, and how the college will now ensure that it delivers the appropriate volume of learning for its students. I'd now like to invite Ian McMillan to make an opening statement. Thank you, convener. Uh, just, just a couple of minutes, I think, just to set some of the context. I think uh, we as a college did submit a, a one-page summary of the actions that have been taken uh, recently by the, by the new board to show the steps that we have been taken to address the issues outlined by the Auditor General in the report. Um, the college does have a new board in place, and it's a board in which the independent members of the board have been appointed by UHI. The board has, in its totality, been in place since last September, so we're just coming to the end of its first full cycle of, uh, of activity as a board. The board itself is very focused on the challenges faced by the college, particularly in regard to student recruitment and the impact that uh, failure to meet student recruitment targets has on the finances of the college. And in addition to conducting the formal board business, the board has met separately to consider specific issues relevant to the sustainability of the college. And in these sessions, we focus first of all on risk and developing uh, and upgrading the risk register for the college. And subsequently, we met to discuss curriculum and to develop a curriculum action plan that we see has changed the, the way that we delivered curriculum within the college as a result of the challenges that we face. Uh, and a further such meeting is planned for early August to consider finance and to develop a financial strategy response to take account of all the challenges that we face uh, and to make sure that in future that we have everything in place that we're able to respond to the changes in our action plans because it's all very well to plan one thing but we're in a fairly volatile situation and because we are very small small changes have quite a significant impact on us. So we're very conscious that we have to develop a plan that is able to respond to particular scenarios. So we're looking to do that in, in August. Um, a key part of uh, the finances for the college is the, the allocation model that's actually used for further education activity. And with the introduction of the new system in 2015-16 that the new system that simplified the model there were quite a number of complexities that had been within the previous funding model that were lost as a result of that simplification which have caused us difficulties uh, in the highlands and islands in particular because we receive uh, funding and activity from Scottish Funding Council but we've had to develop a mechanism to allocate the, the funding and the activity. Funding was fairly straightforward to the extent that because the Funding Council had allocated the same amount of funding to the region, the same amount of funding was allocated to each college. But the activity levels were a bit more complex and it took us, as, as a region, with the help of SFC until the autumn of last year, to put in place a model that allowed that activity to, to match the, the funding. So for 2017-18, we now have new allocations of activity, which have resulted in Lewis Castle College's activity being reduced down to a level which is of the same level that we've been achieving in the past two years. Uh, and that, as a consequence of that, we have had a reduction in funding, which we have factored into the budgets going forward. And we have been able to accommodate that within our budgets. But uh, like all of these things, it, it will be challenging for us to meet that. So that's one of the reasons as well behind our strategic work in, in August on, on the budgets. But I think it's, it's important for the committee to understand that we are moving forward, taking these, <coughs> taking these observations that, that have come from the 
Audit Scotland that we are taking, that we recognise them, that we're taking them seriously and that we are responding and will continue to respond. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you. I'd like to know a little bit about the governance here. The College has um, been underperforming now to a greater or lesser extent really since 2008-9. What action did the Board take in relation to this? I, th I think, yes, the College has been underperforming in terms of student activity levels. Uh, I think in the Outer Hebrides we're very conscious of the challenges that, we, that we're actually facing in terms of the demographic changes that are occurring within the islands. I think what the, what the Board actually did uh, is they did actually consider some uh, additional strategic responses. Um, particularly in regard to curriculum, employer engagement, student engagement, and, and also marketing. But the Auditor General says that, uh, that uh, these strategies didn't work. They, they didn't work in attracting the, the level of students that we needed. Uh, and again, some of the strategies that we can put in place will not halt some of the demographic changes that we are I mean, it says here there is little evidence of the board taking effective a action. Would you be able to comment on that? Um, I, I think there's, there's little evidence of the action that the board took resulting in an improvement in the situation. I think that would be fair to say, yes. Now, UHI obviously came on the scene in the latter part of this period of uh, underperformance. At what point did you become aware there was a problem and how? Um, if you look at the, um, the, the college and the position of the college, and it's just picking up where Ian has left off, is that it's in quite a fragile area. Um, its funding up until 2015-16 came directly from the funding council, so there's a model that's been in place for a, a period of time. Um, we've taken over that and we've continued to fund at the minute based on that model. However, as a region, we're now looking to see is, is that model appropriate for us in the, in the Highlands and Islands? So we're aware of that and we're aware that actually the college is um, not necessarily underperforming, but maybe overfunded. Uh, but if we had just stripped out that, that overfunding straight away, the college would be in a, a, an incredibly difficult position. So there's, there's the context of the environment within which it sits. However, that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be doing anything. And, and we are starting to take action now. So we're looking at, through the Further Educational Regional Board, which allocates the funding in FE, we're now looking at what's the appropriate amount of funding for the college and other colleges. But in addition to that, we're now starting to look at, um, Ian has mentioned the demographic difficulties, and we know they're there. We're now starting to look to see, with the college, how do we address those? And one of the ways of addressing those is that because of the technology that we use in UHI, it's the technology that has enabled UHI to exist in the first place. So we use a lot of what's called network teaching. So we have the opportunity to actually start taking the college out from the Hebrides and teaching across Scotland, rather than trying to either attract students in the Hebrides or bringing them in. So therefore, we're starting to work to become much more sustainable. And so those are the plans we're now starting to look at, at with the college and saying, all right, where are the areas that you've got expertise, like for example, traditional music, we can start to teach out from that. So we recognize that there is, a, there is an issue around the funding, but if we had just funded based on the model uh, as to their activity levels, the college would be in a really difficult position. So what we're doing is we're looking at this uh, as a regional basis with, with the college as part of the university. When did you actually become aware that uh, there was a problem? Um, well, we've seen that in the last, uh, some, from 15, 16, when we see the figures, we, we've been aware since then that there is a difference between the activity and the funding. And that's, and we've been aware of that since we have uh, inherited that model from the Funding Council. And did SFC know about this? Were they aware about this? Yes. Um, so they, they, they were aware that they were, they were subsidising? 
this college? Um, I'm sh yeah, I'm sure they were. I couldn't comment for the funding council, but uh, we just adopted the model at the funding council. Had. I mean, clearly, you know, there are certain businesses, colleges that might be, as you say, in a fragile area, mm -hmm. which needs a bit more support. Do you think that, uh, in fact, it is capable of being turned around from a financial point of view? Um, yes, I do. I think it requires the support of the university to be able to do that. And I think we need to look at new ways of working. Um, so, for example, we're now looking, starting to look at having um, shared services. Um, at the minute, I'll give you an example. At the minute, we, have, we do more video conference teaching than anybody else in Europe. That's run out of Shetland. So Shetland College run that for us. So we have an opportunity to look at services and try to support uh, the local college. So we could put services in different colleges that are in difficulties. Um, I'm not saying that's the whole solution, but that's part of the solution of um, dealing with a region that is quite fragile. Um, and I think we get our strength from rather than a college operating in isolation as being part of a larger grouping through the university. Mm. You could, because they can then access uh, some of the capacity and capability that may be missing in a very small college. Now, my understanding is the, the board consists of 13 members. Is that still the case? That's correct, yes. But it seems quite big for a, for a small college. That's the minimum required by the Post 16 Act, is really? 13. 13. Uh, now, it says here there's been quite a turnover uh, in, the, in the Auditor General's report, although obviously that's a little bit historic now. And at that point, seven experienced members had left, including the chair. Of the six remaining, are they still on the board? Um, yes, I think of the, of the independent members, it's three, mem three of the independent members who were on the previous board are on the current board. I think the remaining members who are on the current board were staff members and, of course, myself. And the present board, they are, you know, obviously the previous board didn't respond particularly well to the situation and uh, failed to take the action that was required. The current board, have they taken, are they fully informed? Do they, have they, are they fully engaged in taking the action that's required? And has UHI actually signed off on a recovery plan? Um, the, the new board is fully engaged um, and they are taking a more active role in terms of what, what we are doing uh, and what we're actually doing on the, in, on, in an operational sense to, to respond to the problem. In terms of our recovery plan, uh, I think the the information that we've put together as to how we've, as a college, dealt with the reduction in funding has been passed to, to UHI and has been approved and has been through, through the committee process within UHI. So, as far as I'm aware, it's been, it, it has been accepted. And from UHI's point of view, you've approved this. Do you have to send to SFC as well? Are they, are they engaged in it at all or is it handled at regional level? Well, this would be handled at regional level because we're the regional strategic body. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. our, role, our role is to, uh, the main role of the regional strategic body is to ensure the provision of further education in, in the highlands and islands. It's not necessarily to preserve the colleges, although mm -hmm. the colleges obviously are the main delivery vehicles for that. But our, our main responsibility is to ensure the provision of further education in the highlands. Okay. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Very much, convener, and uh, good morning to you. Um, the last committee where we discussed uh, this, this issue, I, I think I, I tried to kind of spring to the defence a wee bit of the, the college and recognising the size of it and raised the question about whether the kind of regional characteristics and targets and so on are really fair when applied to a college in the Western Isles like this. So I wanted to give you an opportunity, Mr McMullen, to, to just sort of tell us about the kind of issues that small rural colleges actually face, because what we're hearing from the HIN quite fairly is that there's all sorts of interventions to help, but that kind of tells me that the model doesn't really work hugely well for your college. I, I think it's, it's a very difficult one, I realise it, it, it's, it's probably something I could talk on at length for a long time. But, uh, 
I think one of, the, one of the challenges that we have as a college, uh, we are the smallest incorporated college, so we're tiny in comparison to, certainly to large regional colleges. There is, a, there is an expectation, though, that we engage at national level uh, and at regional level in exactly the same way as larger colleges do. Uh, and, and, and we do do that. We, we do engage at regional level and at national level. Uh, and that takes a disproportionate amount of time, probably, from us as a college and a resource to contribute to that. So it would be useful if there was something in the funding regime that recognised that. It's the, the, we are funded on the basis of... We're funded, basically, on, on a per capita basis for, for the number of students that we have. And it is very, very difficult within that, with a very, very low base, to be able to fulfil all the requirements, whether they are from governance right the way through to contributing at, at all the different levels. Um, I think, but I recognise, I, I recognise that in doing that and from being involved in a lot of discussions at national level, that it's very, very hard to get, have a me put one mechanism in place which satisfies the requirements of a large regional college and satisfies the requirements of a college like ours, but we do have a voice at regional level and at national level, and we do try to influence that. Whether anybody listens to that or not is a, is a different matter. Yeah, I mean, I think we discussed Edinburgh in the conversation. I mean, and we compared Edinburgh with Lewis Castle, and it was the same sort of criteria that applied to Edinburgh that was applied to, to you, and I think some colleagues around the table were well, if not surprised at that, just a bit concerned about that. And the notion that you were failing for eight years in a row was one that sat a wee bit uncomfortable with me because of that criteria. And the question that my colleague Colin, he asked, asked there, about, oh, you have, do you have to have 13 members on the board? And you said, oh, we have to, because that's the rules. You know, there's, it seems to me that we need some kind of flexible approach here that recognises the differences and uh, that are evident and obvious in places I like the Western Isles. I, I, I think what we have, what we have in the regionalisation process and in the changes that have come to us is we do have an opportunity to compensate for the challenges that we have as a small college by linking in to services that are available from the university or from other colleges within the Highlands and Islands. There's a need for us as colleges to, to work closer together and to, I think Clive mentioned about sharing services, that's not, there's an assumption that sharing services is always about back office services. But we have to, I mean, we already do to a large extent share teaching. We certainly do across higher education. We will be looking to do that more and more at further education level. We'll be looking to develop curriculum collectively. So each individual college is not developing the curriculum individually for that college. We have expertise that we have that we all need, whether it's financial, legal, marketing. We need to be able to share these because as a college, as an individual college, Lewis Castle is actually probably too small to function independently itself from, from the rest of, of the region, from other colleges. So there is a need for us to work together, and we, we've recognised we've recognised this for for a long period of time. But again, as as islanders, we we also uh, protect our autonomy maybe more than more than most. So there's a need for us to find uh, an accommodation with our partners that allows that to work. Mm. To and work do you, well, do you find that you you need more assistance by way of technology and online? capabilities and so on to, to deliver what you do, much more so than for perhaps Edinburgh might need that, that I, kind of assistance. I, I, I think what we actually have is a well-developed expertise in using technology because we realise that that's, that's what will actually keep us sustainable. We have, a, as, a, as a college, we have played a significant part in, in the development of the university and in developing particularly network courses that certainly at one time we had a disproportionate number of the courses that were offered across UHI were led from Lewis Castle. And the reason for that is that we recognised that we needed to do, to do that. And I think Clive identified earlier that 
there was an opportunity for us to provide some of that learning and teaching opportunity from Lewes Castle out to other people. And because we recognise that need, we probably are better placed and more motivated to make use of that technology and to break new ground. So we, we have been doing that quite significantly, and I would expect that we would carry on doing that. And have you got decent broadband speeds that allow you to we're, participate in this fully and properly? We're getting there. We're getting there. I, th I think I, I think the the broadband debate is is an interesting one. We've we have got first class communications into our into the college sites, uh, and that again we've got some improvement in that again over the summer coming. So so I think into our sites we have I think maybe. In individual pockets within the islands, there are plenty of issues. But mm -hmm. if, just one final question: if you were, if you were to just kind of cap, capture all this and, and, and suggest or make a recommendation for some kind of change or assistance or something that would help your college, what, what would it be? You know, would it be to break free of the straitjacket of the one-size-fits-all approach, or you know? The one the one thing I would say, I, I, I think if there's one thing, if somebody could sort out the VAT landscape so that we could provide services between individual colleges and individual colleges and the university, that opens the door to a whole load of sharing that we currently cannot undertake without incurring a 20% VAT charge. For me, again, I'm an accountant by profession, so for me, that one is the one infuriating thing that's really blocking us and stopping us from addressing some of the bureaucratic challenges that we have. So if, 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 you could, if somebody can unlock that door for me, I would be really grateful. Just pick on that. What do you mean by that? You're constantly paying VAT for cross-service sharing? Or? Be, because we're separate, because we're separate organisations, except for teaching, teaching because education Services directly to students are exempt from VAT, but all other services incur a VAT charge of 20%. And why would you be particularly damaged by that compared to other colleges? And let me well, ask you that. If you take some of the support services like student support, um, we're looking at can we provide a unified student support service across the whole region for all the colleges? We think we can do it in a much more efficient way and actually improve the quality of it because we get better consistency. The problem is that there's a 20% VAT charge on every partner. You know, so if the university provided, there's a 20% VAT charge on that straight away. Um, so you've got to make an extra 20% saving on top before you even start to make savings. And that's, I think that's what Ian's referring to. So how do we address that? We're HMRC. We're, we're, HMRC. We're, we're, work, we're working on it. You're working on it? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, thank you. Just a, a, as a point of clarification, uh, Mr McMillan, you say you're an accountant to trade. Uh, you're currently the principal and chief executive. Uh, you're also currently the senior financial officer, I believe. Uh, yes. When, when I was made principal, we didn't replace the director of finance post. We have, we have a finance manager, so we do have, we do have a, pres a professional accountant who looks after the day-to-day -day operational finances. But you, uh, am I right, just for clarity, that you're doing effectively this, <coughs> all three roles, principal, CEO, and director of finance? At, at the highest, at the strategic level, yes. I, I, don't, uh, I don't play any part in the day-to-day -day operations, mm -hmm. but... Uh, do you envisage that continuing? Um, I, I think when, when I took on the role, what we expected was that we would have moved to the shared services situation within UHI, that we would have been able to move to that fairly quickly, and that some of the financial expertise that I am currently providing, that that would be available mm -hmm. from somewhere else within the network. Because I, I, I don't believe that we need a full-time finance director, but what we actually need is we need that other brain and that other viewpoint that we would actually be better getting from somewhere else within the sector. So just to be absolutely clear, do you envisage it continuing? Uh, I, for, the, for the short term, yes, until we can find a solution. Thank you. Alex Neal. Yeah, 
Can I just go back and build on uh, Willie Coffey's points? Um, I mean, the reason we're here is because the Auditor General has done a report saying for the last eight years you haven't met your targets, essentially. And obviously colleges, unlike universities, their main catchment area is the local community, and I suppose that's even more true uh, of an island community. We're all very well aware of the challenges in terms of the demographics, both in terms of population changes uh, and ageing structures and so on, particularly in island communities. Um, and the Hebrides has had its more challenges than most. So can I start from the beginning? Are the targets themselves, who sets the targets? Um, on what basis are the targets set? And are the targets realistic for uh, an island community like Lewis? Um, I, I think from my point of view, I think the targets have been too high. But because the targets that have been set are directly related to the funding that we receive, um, the funding that we actually receive for those targets is what we need to sustain the level of activity that we have within the college. Um, I, I would say that, and, and we've started to now with this new model, move away from the way things have been traditionally. Um, I, I would actually say that they are too high, but that I wouldn't want to see all the money that's directly relating to these targets being taken away. Yeah, I can at the understand. Same time as the target. Absolutely. But I mean, I, I remember um, working in the old Cumnock and Dune Valley District Council. Um, I didn't work for the council, fortunately, uh, but um, the chief ex then chief executive, this is 30 years ago, I was very young at the time, used to complain about the Scottish office, um, looked to the funding for graveyards in rural areas exactly the same way as they looked at the funding for graveyards in urban areas. And it's a lot cheaper per unit, if I could put it that way, to maintain a graveyard in an urban community <laughs> than it is in a rural community, because in that rural community, there's 16 major settlements and every village wanted its own, to retain its own graveyard. Ergo, the costs of doing so were much higher. So two questions. I think you've answered the first one, which is the targets are too high, but my question is, what input do you have to, on your board to the setting of the target? Is it an iterative process? And I presume it's the SFC originally who set the targets. Is it an iterative process, or is it uh, handed down from on high in Edinburgh, and they decide what the target is, end of story? So what is the process of setting the target? But and, I, th I think traditionally, up until probably up, up until this year, the targets that we have are very much based on targets that were set a number of years ago. I think, if I'm if I'm correct in thinking, I think 2010-11 was quite a major change point for the FE sector in terms of funding and in terms of activity, and all the activity levels that we've had since have been based on that position in 2010-11. And as changes have been made as a result of uh, regionalisation, etc., that they've all been based on that. And I think there's been so much change in the sector that a lot of these targets have not really been revisited since that time. And, and these targets were set by the SFC? Yes. Right. And, and did you have any input into the targets at that time? Uh, I, it, in, in terms of them being set, no, not really. I think there's a, you would look at them and say, well, you accept the targets. Uh, and we do, we do always have the opportunity to say, or we did in the past, have the opportunity to say yes or no to the targets. But I think it's, that's one of these questions that the answer has, to that has to be yes, because you don't really know what the consequences of no and, and ah. that's my point. And you, you're very really nervous about saying, well, we can't accept that target because then your funding will be cut. Because I think the second point you're really saying is, <coughs> and that's where the analogy comes in with the cost of graveyards in Cumnock and Dune Valley 30 years ago, is that the unit cost of delivering equality further education service in 
Ruiz, by definition, you have far fewer pe people, uh, far fewer units, if I can put it that way, uh, uh, to, um, to spread the cost. You know, it's a lot easier in a bigger college to reduce your unit cost because, you know, there's probably 30, 20 or 30 people in a class, whereas you'd be lucky to get, what, five or six, ten in a class, maybe. So, are you saying then, number one, the, t the original targets were unrealistic to start with, probably, and you didn't really have much of an input into it. And secondly, that there is not sufficient recognition of the additional cost of delivering FE in a community like Lewis. Would that be a fair comment? It, 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 it would be a fair comment. There are, there are mechanisms within, within the funding process and with, that we have been in discussions with that we do get a premium for remoteness and rurality. But it's insufficient. Which, which is added, no. But uh, I, I, I think there are always, uh, and, and that's always one of our challenges when we're looking to do things at national level, is you will always get this difference of, uh, of view and opinion between urban and rural, yeah. uh, and, and rural people. And it's finding the right balance to that is always going to be difficult. But, but in your opinion, there hasn't been, although there is a premium, the premium isn't actually if I could put it this way, generous enough to recognise the reality of the cost pressures that you are under in a remote rural island community with a relatively very small catchment area with an ageing population, and I think I'm right in saying with Lewis, a falling population still? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 think, I, I think if I was to put... I, th I, think, I think what you said a short while ago, that we've got... If we make an assumption that for full-time courses that uh, an average class size might be 20, the, the highest, I think, that we've had as an average class size has been, over a year, has been nine. Right. So, so in theory, it costs us twice as much per student to deliver those courses, but we do not receive twice, twice as, as much. much per student. Right. To fund it. So it's now, obviously, some of that, by sharing services in the future, some of that can be addressed. Yeah. But it seems to me there's a fundamental inbuilt unfairness. Um, if the targets are not reflective of the reality of the situation on the ground, and the subsidy, uh, or the, the money going to the college isn't reflective of the true additional cost, uh, particular unit cost, um, of being in a remote rural island community. And it seems to me that we need to get those fundamentals right before we can judge whether you're performing properly or not. Could I, can I come in there? Just from the university perspective, um, what, we get funded for further education on a regional basis. I'm so not blaming it, you, by the way. Uh, no. So even though <laughs> I'm going to come on to that, I've got an ask. <laughs> um, we get funded on a regional basis. So even though the college has underperformed and hasn't met its targets, the region as a whole has. In fact, we've overperformed yeah. in that. So, um, so our responsibility is to look at it on a regional basis. However, when you have colleges like Lewis Castle that are in this, a very fragile area, there are difficulties. Yeah. It is more expensive to deliver that. If we had taken the decision when the, uh, the funding model came over to us to just fund them based on their activity levels, that would have a catastrophic effect yeah, on absolutely. the college. Yeah. So we have to look, we've got to do two things. One is we've got to look to see, can we reshape the college to get it into a better position? And then the other one, and this is the ask, is that from a political perspective, we would argue that um, it then becomes a political decision as to what you're willing to fund out there, because you may never be able to have something that's completely self-sustaining mm. in its own right. Uh, as part of a larger organization, maybe, um, but we would argue that because of those additional teaching costs, we should get increased funding for each student because of that. Uh, and that would follow then if you make a political decision that you want to support yeah. you know, the regional development. And if you look at wider economic issues, I mean, clearly the government's policy, every successive government in here since this place was established <coughs> has been to try to do what we can to increase the population and particularly to retain younger people in the island communities and therefore to um, in any way reduce the quality and the range of services provided by a college like Lewis is going to work against that policy because very clearly the age profile of people who go to college is younger people. Um, so it seems to me that there's 
you know, we need to be very clear about the wider policy issues in relation to uh, a community like Lewis. I mean, Inverness is at the other end, which is, you know, supposedly the fastest growing city in the UK, if not in Europe. Uh, and, you know, therefore, as you say, you're dealing with Inverness at one end and you're dealing with Lewis at the other, and you have to recognise it's a completely different scenario um, in both of them. The purpose for the university being set up was to stop the drain of young people from out of the region. Absolutely. Because it was, it exactly. was absolutely clear that when they went to the central belt or elsewhere for education, they never came back. That's right. Um, and we've been very successful at doing that. Yeah. But that comes at a cost. Yes. And the costs in a regionally dispersed organisation are going to be much higher because we have got, I've got 13 libraries, 13 learning yep. resource centres, we've got all of that across to maintain. And the answer is for us to get control of VAT in here and abolish VAT in the services between uh, the different colleges, and that might fund the additional resources we need for places like Lewis. If you can get rid of VAT, we'd be delighted. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have control of it, but I'm sure that's going to change, Liam. Thank you. <laughs> is that relevant, Mr Neil? Of course it is. It's relevant to, to what they were saying. We'll move on. Monica Lynn. <laughs> yeah, just really briefly, can you just, you know, um, picking up the discussion there that Alex Neil has, has led so capably, the, the point that, that we've settled on there that, you know, what's set nationally isn't always going to work at that very local level. Have you made that case, or, or the college or the UHI, have you made that case too? Scottish Government about that apparent mismatch? Yes, we, I mean, at every opportunity, I take, the, I take every opportunity I can to say, and my colleagues as well across the partnership will say, um, we would say we do have challenges that are unlike other, other universities um, across Scotland, very big challenges. Okay, and do you think the Scottish Government recognises those challenges? Uh, I think they do, yes. I think, I think everybody recognises the challenges as, as they, the difficult bit is what you do about it. Okay. Just in terms of the the, the students themselves, I mean, I know previously a, a large number of your students um, were part-time learners and older students. Um, given the, the change in national policy, I just wonder if you can say what the the learning opportunities are for students who are over 24 in the, in the island communities. Um, we have... We, st we still have a wide range of, of, of learning opportunities, but what uh, probably what's actually happened as a, as a result of some of the changes is that we ha have had to focus more on our full-time courses. And because our resources are taken, taken up on these full-time courses, we just don't have the additional capacity to develop new activities for, for, other, for other groups. But we have... We have actually been working at building that activity back up again and trying to make sure that we are, that we're actually providing some interesting and useful opportunities for, for people as well. I think some of, some, of, some of the changes, you know, in the past, because we've been offering courses and nothing had been available, it was a lot easier to attract people to actually come in and do it, but now we have to be a bit more innovative and make things a bit, a bit more interesting to, to, to attract people to come in. And that, that has been difficult in the, in the financial climate that we've had. OK, I mean, I'm sure as part of the work that you're doing, you're always taking into account the needs of, of local employers. Are you able to say something about the, the local labour market and any sort of change in trends since... The, the new policies came into effect? Yes, yeah. We'd, we're, we've been hit particularly hard, I think, by the downturn in oil and gas, in the oil and gas industry. We've got very, we've got very good pathways through to qualifications in, on the engineering side of, of our activities that provided uh, good opportunities for young people in particular to get, to get trained to work in the oil and gas sector, okay, a, a lot of them working offshore, but they maintain their, their homes and their families in the islands. Uh, that has been quite a difficult change for us and a, and, and a difficult transition because I, I think in terms of aspiration and perceptions, particularly again of young people, the assumption is that that tap has just been turned off, which it hasn't. There are still opportunities in oil and gas uh, but unfortunately, the, a lot of the 
the media coverage, for example, about oil and gas being in crisis and, and big reductions have resulted in fewer young people uh, looking to take uh, qualifications in engineering. And we are looking to address that to encourage to encourage more people to get back in there because there is still work and there will actually be work available for them. So we are looking at that. We've had particular challenges in construction, in construction trades, in the construction industry, uh, and in quite a number of, of courses where we still actually offer the, the courses, but the numbers are getting so small that it's becoming it, it's becoming very, very difficult for us to, to maintain some of what were the traditional trades in the construction industry. But we are working with the trade bodies and the companies to try and do something about that. No, that's helpful. I was just going to finish by asking, um, are you getting support from, from the, the industries themselves? Because I know that the audit in Scotland report talked about you know, your, your marketing efforts and perhaps haven't been effective. Is there more that the industry can do to support uh, your work? Yes, yes, there, are, there always is. I mean, we're not going to be able to train apprentices if they're not actually taken on by the companies. Mm -hmm. But again, also the companies at times have been finding it difficult to even recruit traditional apprentices because, I, I, again, there doesn't seem to be that motivation to go into an industry that's maybe seen as uncertain and, uh, and that work isn't guaranteed. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a great deal of sympathy uh, with the points my colleagues are making about the numbers and how it's all arrived at. My difficulty is that the college has effectively been funded for eight years, or on eight separate occasions if you like, in excess of what it needed to deliver. Uh, and there has to be an argument that, that some, somebody is funding that. It, almost the other colleges are subsidising that shortfall. Uh, but it then begs a question of UHI. You've only recovered that funding, that overspend, if you like, on one occasion in eight years, as I understand it. Uh, why do you not recover that money? And who, who takes that decision and based on what criteria? responsible for that money before 1516. So that was that was a Scottish funding council funded the college before then. I was going to ask about them after, yeah. so perhaps so, we'll deal with that now. So they, so they funded it. So that's yeah. a question I think you need to ask the, the funding council. We are aware uh, of the situation the college is in. And it's the, the problem that we've got is that if we just clawed that back instantly from the college, I said it would have that huge impact on them. Mm -hmm. Now we don't want to do that. Um, we want to work with the college and we want to develop uh, a sustainable model, as sustainable as we can be. But again, that's another reason why you have um, a regional university and you have the colleges all within that. It's, the, the analogy I would say, it's a bit like um, if you take a traditional university, there are some faculties are, are seen as the cash cows within the university and they sometimes support. So the engineering and the business faculties quite often cross-subsidize the humanities. Um, in our case, we've, we work together as a collective of all of those. And with 13 partners, we're always going to have a position where some are up and some are down because the local challenges are very different at different times. So we have to, as a group and as an institution like that, is try and manage that process. Now, ideally, I would like every single college um, to be self-sustaining and to actually deliver a surplus that we can use to reinvest in the business. Uh, but we've got certain restrictions on us. So uh, one way of dealing with that is we get better at what we do. And the other way, as I said earlier, is to actually uh, push harder for additional funding for the region and get recognition the fact that it is going to be more expensive to deliver across large parts of our organization. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. Can I uh, make a comment on that as well? I I understand, I understand what you're saying. I have some difficulty with some of the wording of it because it suggests that we're actually using money for something that, in a, in a way that, that it's improper, that somehow that uh, because we're spending all the money that we actually receive, that we spend the money on delivering the learning and teaching that we offer right across the piece. So it's not that 
it's not that we're using using the the money in an improper way. So we are actually using the money to the best effect that we can in terms of what we offer. Uh, and I think and I think the reality is, if UHI or SFC actually came back to take the money back, we've spent that money in delivering the services that that we have actually delivered. So it's not that we've got that money sitting somewhere and, and not working towards the benefit of the students that we have, mm -hmm. albeit that there aren't as many of them as the targets that have been set for us. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't intend to imply anything like that. Uh, let me give that reassurance. Uh, just turning back, because I think, Mr Mulholland, you made a good point there, uh, but isn't there a risk that other colleges in the, in the fold will look at what's happened over eight years and there's almost a, a disincentive on them to meet their own targets because yeah. they're looking and saying, well, you only recovered... Uh, whether you could or not, but you only recovered the overfunding, if I can put it that way, for, on one occasion out of eight years. Uh, so why are we striving to meet our targets? Why don't we just do the um, same thing? I can, answer, I can answer that. We've now got in place a process, and it goes back to, I think, some of the questions that uh, Mr Neil was asking earlier about the involvement in setting the targets. We inherited the model from the Funding Council. So the seven years before that, you'd have to ask the Funding Council we inherited that model. We are in the transition at the minute. We did not want to do anything that would put at peril and at risk one of the colleges. Uh, we now have a process in place through our further educational regional board, and all of the partners have input into that, and they determine how they're going to allocate the, uh, the resources among the partnership. So uh, at the minute, we've got Lewis Castle. We are reducing the credits that we're going to give them. That's a deliberate decision that has been made. So we're moving away from the status quo, but we want to do that in a managed way. And as you say, I don't want us to be in a position where people think they can just sit back. So we're now changing that process and that process will continue to evolve um, over the next couple of years in terms of that funding as we refine that funding model. Uh, and just one final point then, just to, to wrap up that whole area. Are you aware if any of the other colleges in the, in the fold are experiencing difficulties in achieving their targets? Um, are in, there, some of them are quite close. Um, again, it's a reflection of a fragile environment. It's a reflection of the financial uh, environment that we're in at the minute. But um, none of them are, at the minute, are in the position that Murray College is in. Right. Thank you. Do colleagues have any further questions? Right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move into private session. I thank the witnesses.